All of us know the importance of preparation. School teachers, who we have a few in the room, or former school teachers, understand that as they are getting ready for every day, they spend probably a good amount of time after, after hours preparing for their lessons. Sunday school teachers understand the importance of preparation. Uh, recently, in our, the Olympics that we had during the summer, you know, we just take for granted what, what we saw as competition, but there were years of preparation that those athletes have, have done to master and prepare themselves for that event. Uh, preparation is when we give much thought and organized structure uh, for an event, an exercise, or an endeavor so that the thing we are preparing for, uh, when it occurs, it turns out equal to or better than planned. Uh, preparation is important. If, we, if you're someone who doesn't like to prepare, let me, let me give you a few reasons why preparation is important. Preparation shows concern for an organization. Uh, preparation shows concern for an outcome. When we do something, we want a right outcome. Let me, let me tell you, as we look at last Saturday's West Contra Costa outreach, there was a lot of preparation. There was a lot of, a lot of timelines. There was a lot of uh, you know, uh, predetermined uh, uh, checkpoints we had to use, and uh, we wanted a great outcome for that. Preparation is necessary for that. By the way, I want to tell you tonight, God blesses preparation. Amen? And so preparation shows that we care about what we do and the people we do it for. Preparation is necessary so that we're not caught off guard or blindsided. Preparation is necessary for a good report. Preparation is needed so that we can be sure we have adequate resources for a planned event. Preparation is necessary for an acceptable and well-received presentation. Students, you understand this. You're going through school and when you have those 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 midterms and finals, and you have a, a, you know, something to present, you realize the preparation, it's all about the preparation. You've got to be prepared for that. You go into the professional work, you've got to be prepared and ready. I read the story about several centuries ago how a Japanese emperor commissioned one of the great artists of their time uh, to paint a specific type of bird. And so the, the emperor, just thinking that that would be just something that he would probably just go out to nature, observe that bird out in nature, that he'd have it within a month or so. Uh, a month went by. Six months went by, a year went by, two years went by, three years went by. Honestly, the emperor got very annoyed and, exa and exasperated. He's like, what is going on here? I keep asking this guy what's going on. Why is this, this not happening? So finally, the emperor went to the artist's home brought an entourage with him. They knocked on the artist's door, and he said, he said, sir, I came to see you. I want to know what is going on with this project. I've sent request after request. You keep telling me you're working on it. I want to see what you have to do. To which the artist said, sir, come on in, emperor. Come on into my studio. I want to show you what I'm doing. He led the emperor into the studio. When he got there, the emperor saw this huge canvas there. The canvas was blank, and he's thinking, what's going on here? Why did he bring me in here? The canvas was blank, but then the, the, the artist started to go to work. As he looked at that blank canvas, the artist took out a number of renderings and drawings and, and accumulation things he had. He brought tons, of just a countless numbers of drawings of feathers and wings and bird heads and feet, etc., etc. And after all of this had been done, he started to draw that bird, and it was it was an exact replica, drawing-wise, in terms of what that that artist was looking for. And the art, as the emperor looked at, he was amazed at the artistic professionalism and the artistic mastery by which the the artist had applied himself to them. And he said, uh, he said, why did it take you so long? And he said, sir, I had, it took me a while to accumulate and to find all of these necessary uh, uh, pieces of information so I can complete the drawing. And I think what the artist was saying was what we're seeing in our passage tonight, that he had to prepare himself for his commission. In Amos chapter 4, this chapter is about preparation. In Amos chapter 4, we find the second of three messages that Amos is delivering uh, as the messenger of God to the nation of Israel. It's the second message. In this message, the theme of this message is found in verse 12. In verse 12, he gave a simple but yet very firm message. Prepare to meet thy God. Prepare to meet thy God. He's telling Israel, you need to prepare to meet God as a nation. But going drilling beneath that, he's also telling every individual. He's telling the kings. He's telling the princes. He's telling the priests. He's telling the people, you need to prepare to meet your God individually. Now, we will either be prepared to meet God one day, or we're going to meet God unprepared. We're not going to change that date. The date has been set. We're going to meet God. We're going to meet God, okay? And we have to understand something. We better be prepared to meet our God. Meeting God is inevitable. Meeting God is unavoidable. We must prepare to meet our God. My question is, we begin our message tonight. Are you prepared to meet your God? Notice several things we see 
about this passage of Scripture. We start off there with verse 1, and he says, hear this word. Same, same things he said in chapter 3, verse 1. Hear this word. God is speaking to his people, and as he's speaking to them, notice in verse 2, verses 1 and 2, he's speaking to them about their sin. He said in verse 1, hear this word, ye kind, or if you would, you cows, or if you would, you heifers of Bashan, which are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, crush the needy, which say to their masters, bring and let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that lo, these days shall come upon you, that he will take you away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. Now, as God is speaking, two things I want to say. Number one, God is drawing their attention. It's a second message. He said, hear this word. He's pulling their attention to a, a, a different aspect of sin that he needs to deal with there. And then he says, secondly, the Lord has sworn by his holiness. God is speaking according to holiness. And here we see God is addressing through Amos the atrocities of their sin. The atrocities of their sin. May I say tonight, all sin is an atrocity against a holy God. All sin is an atrocity against a holy God. Notice, for instance, the severity of their sins. He lists out here uh, in verse 1, he says, which oppress the poor and, the, and, the, and crush the needy. Now, in verse 1, he's calling out the luxurious and careless lifestyles of the people. And uh, he's talking about just how they had, had prospered. They had had a, close to 200 years of prosperity. Uh, they had done well. Things were at peace. The surrounding nations were not bothering them that time. And so they were doing well. The economy was doing good. They had, they had food on the table. They had multiple houses. We saw in another, another message how they had summer houses and winter houses. Their investments were doing good. I mean, everything was going well for them. Things were going good for them there. And he's calling them out because they had gotten to the place where there was great oppression. They were taking advantage advantage of other people. And specifically, they were taking advantage of those who were poor. Now, in those days, poor meant very poor. Poor meant basically they, there was starvation. Poor men in those days, not enough money to get by. I mean, they had to scrap by. I mean, they, they were beggars, and they had to beg for things. And so the poor were being oppressed through threatenings and through harassments. Uh, if you look, at, you look at chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, he says something about that. In chapter 2, verse 6, he says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sow the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. They pant that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn, away, turn aside the way of the meek. I mean, basically, they were taking advantage of these people. God's calling out their inhumanity. They were inhumane to their fellow Israelites. They were treating them disrespectfully. They were treating them wrongfully. They took advantage of them. Uh, the women, the women, if you would, you notice in verse 1, he calls out the kind, or the, if you would, literally means the cows, or if you would, he's calling out the... Um, the heifers, and, and, and don't be offended by the ladies, but he's actually talking to the ladies there. He's speaking about the ladies of, of the nation of Israel. He calls them uh, heifers and cows, and the reference there, he was just, wasn't trying to be derogatory. God was just basically saying, you've gotten to the place where you've just enjoying the fat life, and, uh, and you're just enjoying life as it is, and you're just kind of, you're just indulging yourself in pleasure, and you're taking advantage of other people with that. Uh, notice this here. Uh, he's talking, he says, which say to their masters, the word masters can also be translated the word husband. And he's basically saying these were bossy women. They basically were telling their husbands, hey, bring me more alcohol to drink. Uh, bring me more to drink. Uh, would you serve me more of these type of things there? And so basically he's saying their God was disapproving of them, uh, approving, disapproving of them from, uh, from their just focusing on just accumulations in their life and nothing about God and taking advantage of those who had little to nothing. So God calls out their inhumanity. God calls out that which is inappropriate. He said it was inappropriate for them to place their material possessions above God. Now we know that's still the same today. God calls us out for placing our material possessions and what we accumulate, what we have over God. He calls out excessive, luxurious, and careless lifestyle. Uh, look at Amos 6.4, please. In Amos 6.4, here's an example of that. He speaks about how they were lying upon beds of ivory and stretching themselves upon their couches. I mean, they're just, they're just kind of just, you know, they're kind of like the, the expression, they were just, you know, just uh, being very slothful and indolent and just, and just, you know, enjoying the good life. They were eating the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall. I mean, I guess the best way I could talk, talk about that, they were enjoying the best of the lamb. They were eating rack of lamb and veal, if you would, and uh, they were anointing themselves with the chiefest of ointments. I mean, they were doing what, they basically were practicing, everybody wanted to be rich. 
rich, and everybody wanted the rich lifestyle. They wanted the, the lifestyle, the rich and the famous, if you would, there. So God's calling out the inappropriate. God calls out their intoxication. He speaks about here about how they continue to get drunken with wine and, uh, and, and drinking out of bowls. God was calling out their idolatry. Golden calf worship was going on at Bethel and Dam. That had been started by Jeroboam the king when there was a split between him and, and Rehoboam there. So God's calling out their idolatries. In chapter 2, verse 7, he calls out their immoralities. I mean, God, there's, a, you know, when we look at these things, there's great severity to that because here was a nation that was a holy nation and peculiar people. Here was a nation that, that walked with God and lived for the Lord, but they allowed other influences to come into their nation. And those other influences kind of took their heart away from God and they were going in different directions there. So there's all these different sins that are going on there. And when we look at that, we say, well, man, this just sounds like just like what we're experiencing today. It is. It's exactly the same because the heart of man has not changed. Amen? Sin is still the same. You say, has sin gotten worse? No. The sin of man is, de- the man's sinful nature is still depraved. Man's nature, when it comes to sin, is still lawless there. And so we see the severity of their sin, the severity in this atrocity. But notice the sarcasm. God, God does some, uh, gets, makes some sarcastic statements about their sins. Uh, we mentioned this in verse 1. In verse 1, he calls out the women who are living very lavish and worldly lifestyle. Basically, they were kind of like, uh, you know, like these, these, uh, uh, these, uh, these soap opera type of women and these, these uh, reality stars and those type of things who are flaunting that kind of lifestyle. And he's basically saying that they were living unconcerned about the spiritual things of God. Uh, secondly, he calls out the repeated sins. Look at verses 4 to 5 to see the, the sarcasm God uses. Look at verse 4. He says, Come to Bethel and transgress. Well, Bethel means the house of, house of God and the house of bread. And Bethel, when you look at its origins, we find the first mention of Bethel in Genesis chapter 28 when Jacob went there and uh, it was his first stop the night he left his home on the way to see his uncle. And uh, when he was there at Bethel, uh, you know, he, he saw that ladder that went from earth to heaven and uh, he said, this is none other than the house of God. And he called that location Bethel. It was there that we believe that Jacob had his salvation experience. It was there that he called on the living God and he made a tie that and they built an altar there. Bethel had been known as the place where God was honored, but Bethel was the place where Jeroboam established golden calf worship. And so, you know, what, what, what had been said, should have been said, is come to Bethel and worship, but God says, come to Bethel and transgress. I mean, God's being sarcastic with them. He says, okay, you go to Bethel and you make your offerings to the golden calves. You go to Bethel and you're offering, you're making uh, sacrifices to other idol gods. He says, just go ahead, go to Bethel and do your sinning, go ahead. Go ahead, you know, just do your thing. Go to Bethel. Go to Bethel and sin. And he says, and at Gilgal, multiply transgressions. It's interesting. At Gilgal, we see we have two significant events about Gilgal. Significant event number one is when, when Joshua was going to cross the Jordan River, remember he told them to grab, take 12 stones and establish those 12 stones on the other side when they crossed over, when they went from one side to the side to Gilgal. And, uh, you know, Gilgal means basically a rolling. It means to, be, to roll. And uh, they got over that side and those stones, Stones were established as a memorial, a memorial of God, and leaving them to cross over there. Well, later on, they, they, uh, the men had to be circumcised there, and Gilgal was a place, represented the place of cutting. You know, in its, early, in its earlier mentions, Gilgal is a spiritual place. It had great spiritual significance in the history of the people. But Gilgal, as you look at the book of Hosea, and you look at the book of Amos here, Gilgal had now, had now drifted, and Gilgal became a place of idolatrous worship. And God, through Hosea, and God, through Amos, addresses that issue. God's being sarcastic. These places have become centers of idol worship and departure from God. Then he said this. He said, bring your sacrifices every morning, which they were not doing. He's being sarcastic. Come on, bring your sacrifice every morning. But they weren't doing that. And your tithes every three years. They got to the place when, when the good times came, the money was coming in. They became careless in their tithing. They stopped their tithing. They stopped their giving. And before long, it got to a place where they weren't giving anymore. They weren't tithing. They were just kind of throwing a tip in the, in the offering there for God. And they had, they had forsaken this. So God's being sarcastic with them. He says, come to Bethel and transgress. Go to Gilgal and multiply your transgress. Go ahead and do that. Then he said in verse 5, he says, offer sacrifices and thanksgiving with leaven. Now you never offered leaven with your, with your sacrifices because leaven's a picture of sin. And yet they, he said, well, go ahead offer your sacrifice with leaven because that's what they were doing there. And he says, and proclaim and publish the free offerings. That's not what they were doing there. He says, for this liketh you, O ye children of Israel. Now that phrase, for this liketh you, means basically this. This is just like who you are. 
And God is speaking to them about the atrocities of their sin. He says, doesn't this sound just like you? He said, hear ye this word. He says, don't you realize that I'm speaking as a holy God? Brethren, tonight as we look at the nation of Israel and God using the prophet Amos, a man who was a sheep herder, a man who was a gatherer of sycamore fruits, here's this, this crusty, rustic uh, uh, preacher standing there calling out the people in their sins. He's telling them, don't you know that God is a holy God? God is swearing by his holiness there. Hear ye the word of God. Now I wonder tonight as we think about this, what sins, as we think about what's going with Israel, what sins is God speaking to us about? What sins are coming to our mind? What things in our life is God calling out as a holy God? I like what Tozer said. He said, a man by his sin may waste himself which is to waste that which on earth is most like God. This is man's greatest tragedy and God's heaviest grief there. Number one, we see the atrocities. Number two, which you notice in this passage, we see the aftermath. Look at verse two and look at verses six to 11. We see the atrocities of sin. Notice we see the aftermath of sin. We see the judgment of God. Now God doesn't waste any words and God is very black and white here and calling out the sins of the people. Notice, and the judgment of God upon their sins. In verse Seven. Notice he, he mentions the judgment of drought. Also, I have withheld the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest. And I mean, he's just, he's just punching them right where they can feel it. He's saying, listen, you need the early rains and you need the latter rains. He said three months to the harvest is talking about those latter rains. He said you need that final set of rains so the harvest can be, uh, can be very strong and very good for the year. And he says, I withheld the rain. There was no rain. He said, not only that, I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. He says, one piece was rain upon and the peace were upon it rain not it withered. He said, listen, I sent rain to one place, other places I did not. He says in the next verse, he said, where it did rain, two or three cities came together to go to that place so they could, they could get the rain and take advantage of the water. I mean, they didn't have modern irrigation systems. They didn't have East Bay mud. They didn't have pumping systems. They basically had to, re way out in the desert areas, especially where Israel's at, they had to rely on God sending the rain and to replenish their wells and so forth there. So God's talking about the judgment of drought, which we know in the book of Deuteronomy. God said much about this. He says, if you honor me, I will bless you. And he said part of that blessing in Deuteronomy 11 would be upon their cross, upon their land. Then notice verse 6, there's the judgment of famine. He says, and I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want your bread in all your places. That basically... Is, is a phraseology, figure of speech of saying, God sent them famine. There'd be nothing to eat. He said, you'd have a shortage of food there. And he says, uh, he says there's, this would be the judgment of God. Notice in verse 7 and 8, we see the judgment of desperation. People wandering from city to city to find a better climate. No water shortage and finding, trying to find stability in the rain. Hey, we're seeing it right now. People are tired of the taxation in California. They're tired of crime in California. They're tired of all these different, our climate and our polit politics and everything like that. People are moving. They're jumping ship. They're leaving here. And they're thinking, if I go to Idaho, and if I go to Texas, things will be better. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter where you go. If you're still in sin, it doesn't change the situation. Amen? Changing the geography, changing the location doesn't change you. You got to change you. Amen? Doesn't change the situation there, okay? So there's a judgment of drought, judgment of famine, judgment of desperation. Notice verse 8, the judgment of crop destruction. Don't, don't tell me here in California that the affliction that we're seeing in the Central Valley where crops are wasting, shortage of water and policy, all that, don't tell me that's not God's judgment on a very liberal state that's anti-God and anti-Christ. Oh, it's global warming. No, it's the judgment of God. There's a judgment of pestilence, the spread of disease, sickness, and death. Look at verse 10. I've sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Hey, go back there. I think it's in, um, I think it's in uh, Exodus chapter 16, 15 or 16. I think it's maybe Exodus chapter 15, where God, God brought them to the waters of Mara. Remember that? And they tasted the waters, and the waters were bitter. And God told Moses, he said, okay, Moses, here's what you need to do. Chop down a tree and throw the tree into the water, and the waters became sweet. And then God gave them a message there. He says, listen, you know, if you obey me and live for me, I'll bring none of these diseases upon you, which I brought upon Egypt there. And those people of Israel, I mean, they, they saw with their own eyes, they saw the devastation on the land of Egypt as pestilence went through there. Pestilence has the idea of a plague. Pestilence has the idea of a pandemic. Pestilence has the idea of death. 
pestilence has the idea of just of all the things that go with that. And he says the, the spread of disease, sickness, and death, according to verse 10 there. Uh, then we see, the, we see the, the judgment of war. Look at verse 10. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses and I've made the stink of your camps to come up to your nostrils. Listen, the, 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 the carnage of war was so bad, they couldn't even bury their dead. Read the book of Revelation during the tribulation. Listen, there'll be so many dead people after that three and a half year time, they won't, they won't be able to bury it. God's going to send birds of the air to come and consume the flesh of those dead bodies. And for Israel's sake, he's telling, listen, when the Assyrians come, because he talked about that in verses 1 and 2, when the Assyrians come, listen, your young men will be slain by the sword, and he says, their bodies will rot in those camps because you won't be able to go in there because of either it's, it's too dangerous to go in there, or basically there won't be enough manpower to bury them, and basically the stink of their camp, the stench of the rotting flesh will be so putrefying that you won't be able to stand it. Then in verse 11, he talks about the judgment of defeat and overthrow. Look at verse 11. He says, I have overthrown some of you, even as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, you are as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. He's saying, those of you who were spared, you're like a brand plucked out of the burning there. Uh, He speaks about in verse 2, captivity and bondage. He says, the Assyrians will come in and take you away with hooks and your posterity. That means your children with fish hooks. I'm saying tonight, sin is a curse. This is the curse of sin. This is the aftermath of sin. This is the judgment of God. Instead of blessing, we see the people cursed. Beloved, tonight, I don't mean to be harsh or anything like that, but God judges sin. God judges sin. Oh, we cannot be light about sin. Oh, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot uh, just throw it under the carpet and stick our head in the sand and think that nothing's about that. I mean, we, we just understand sin offends a holy and righteous God. God must deal with sin. And God had to deal with Adam and Eve. Got to deal with Sodom and Gomorrah. God dealt with Egypt. Uh, we're, we've been going through uh, a series in the growth groups there, and I mean, we've, we've dealt with some of David's sins. Remember that? A baby with no name. God had to deal with David. God had to deal with King Asa. God had to deal with King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. God dealt with Nebuchadnezzar. God had to deal with the rich man in Luke 12. Listen, God has to deal with you and me. Yes, he does. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. It amazes me, people that cover up their sin and they excuse something that comes into life as just being an accident. That's not an accident. God's trying to get our attention. God wants to understand he loves us, but when we're just going haphazard, listen, he that being often reproved, he that being often reproved, the Bible says sudden destruction shall come upon him. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, Psalms 19, verse 9. Judgment is coming. We see the atrocities of their sin. We see the aftermath of their sin. Notice, if you would, in in this passage, notice the apathy towards sin. Now, apathy is a strong indifference, a carelessness about the cause and effect. Because, you know, when there's sin, that's the cause. The effect is judgment, right? Cause and effect. Five times, five times in this chapter, the Lord uses, he describes his judgment, which I think we can agree tonight, they were pretty severe judgments, amen? And then he said five times in verse 6, verse 8, verse 9, verse 10, and verse 11. Yet, Ye have not returned unto me. They ignored what God was saying. They ignored the chasing hand of God. They became indifferent towards us, like, okay, it's just whatever there. They just just kind of watched, just you know, just said they just you know said disregarded it. They were hardened, they were insensitive, their conscience was seared, Uh, they didn't care. And as we think about that, why did they become so indifferent? Not about you. I, I believe this. If you're a God-fearing person, God doesn't have to tell you twice. Amen. 
I think if you're a God-fearing person, just one time, you, God gets your tent, you say, okay, Lord, what did I do? What are you trying to tell me? And let me give you some reasons for apathy that might touch the core of our hearts tonight. First, something or someone has stolen our affection. Where we once loved God, but we don't love him the same. Hey, listen, no man can serve two masters. You can't serve two masters, okay? There's no way. You either love God or you're not going to love God. And so someone has stolen our affection. Number two, it could be we replace the valuable with the cheap substitute. Remember Rehoboam? He had shields of gold. He allowed them to be stolen. And he replaced them with shields of brass. Brass and gold are not the same, amen? Not the same, okay? Inferior value. Sometimes we take a cheap substitute for that which is very valuable. Number three, we can allow accumulation and wealth and worldliness and uh, all the successes of life. And again, God's not against success, okay? The Bible speaks about good success, does it not? The Bible says that forget not, it's the Lord your God which give you the power to acquire wealth. Uh, did he not address that, that, that uh, rich people to be rich in good works and, and willing, ready to distribute? I mean, he talked about that there. But here's what he's saying. When we allow our possessions to possess us, here's what happens. When all the accumulations, all the education, all of these things we have, they can get us to the place where it gives us a false sense of security. And with that false sense of security, we can tend to become self-righteous in our judgment and in our dealings. Now you think we were just a minute. Some of you might remember being a starving student and struggling along the way. Mom and dad couldn't help you out. You wonder if you're going to make it. And man, you remember those days, they were hard and they were difficult. You remember working two jobs, maybe three jobs. You remember just working away. You remember praying more than you ever prayed before. And now God supplied your need. And you were thankful for that. But listen, as you started to, start to go up the ladder and you started to get increased, and you started to get recognized and hard work was paying off because God blesses hard work. As all that was happening, you became more busy and you became more occupied. And listen, the things that you used to hunger for, you don't have to hunger for it anymore because you become, you, you, you're, you're in a different phase of life. Life. And with that different phase of life, we become comfortable and we become blindsided. Uh, we we're blindsided by things and we get a false sense of security. We go to bed our night and put our head on the pillow, not worrying about a thing there until God sends a trial in our life. And here's what God is saying to us He says, one of the reasons why we become indifferent to the things of God is because we're satisfied with life instead of realizing our satisfaction should be with the Lord, not with life. 1 John 1, 7, we are in denial of sin. When you're in denial of sin, you become indifferent to what goes on there. Uh, we lose conscience about sin in our life. We refuse to hear the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, we become proud because we, we hear the preaching and we push it off and we get offended by preaching. By the way, God help our soul that if we have a proper fear of God, we should never be offended by preaching. Amen. We refuse to see God is chasing us and we continue our sin. I'm not just saying right now as we read this, five times God said in this short little 13 verse chapter, he says, yet you have not returned unto me. I'm going to ask you a question tonight. If God is speaking to us about specific sins in our life, maybe nobody knows about it but God, and we ought to thank God for his mercies that he hasn't made it public, amen? Is God speaking to us yet you have not returned to me? I mean, has God repeated the same thing over and over again and yet we've not returned to him? We're ignoring the voice of God. We're saying, we're just pushing off. We're saying, well, God really doesn't care, or maybe there's no consequence to it. And you know what? That's the lie of the devil, because the Bible says there is a consequence to sin. The Jews prayed, but they didn't return to God. They're still living in sin. They were apathetic. The Jews, the Israelites, they were, they were religiously worshiping, but they were still living in sin and, and apathetic. Hey, I want to tell you, listen, you can still pray with a dirty heart, but you're not going to pray very long. And you can pray with a dirty heart, but you know your prayer's not going anywhere because you're afraid, you're afraid of somebody finding out that you're not the real deal, so you're just going through the motions. We know how it is. We know how to pray the, we know how to pray the Pharisaical prayer. We may not do the Our Fathers and Hail Marys like the Catholics, but we got our Baptist versions of that, Amen. And our Baptist versions of it are basically, we know all the words, the terminology with that, and it sounds very impressive. But listen, God, God, doesn't, God, God looks on, doesn't look on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. 
I mean, the Jews were worshiping, and we can, have a, we can have several hundred people, several thousand people that can assemble any particular place to worship God. That doesn't guarantee that everybody in there is spiritual. And that's not a guarantee that everybody there is right with God. And listen, the Jews were assembling there. They held their Passovers, and they had their, 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 they had their Pentecost, and they had, they had all these different feasts that they did. But listen, their hearts, the core of the hearts of many of those people were not right with God. I mean, they were about ready to celebrate the Passover on that, on, on, on that day that they crucified Jesus, and they said, crucify him, crucify him. I mean, that's why Peter, when he got up, he was very strong in his preaching. He said, listen, you murdered the Son of God. And they went through their Passover, just like Pilate when he washed his hands thinking nothing wrong with that. Well, we took care of that rebel rouser. We took care of that man. We, we, we found him guilty. No, you, he wasn't guilty of any of that. You basically kangaroo, put him in a kangaroo court. You crucified our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But listen, Jesus wasn't angry with you because he judged your sins on the cross for you. The Jews fasted. But they were still living in sin. And apathetic. I'm going to tell you tonight, we can do all the religious things. We can pray and we can worship. We can read our Bibles. We can fast. That's not, that doesn't, just because you did the exercise, that doesn't mean that you're clear of sin. Amen? They heard the prophets. I mean, they had Hosea and Amos preaching to them, but they're still living in sin and apathetic. God said to them, yet ye have not returned unto me. We see the atrocities of sin. We see the aftermath of sin. We see the apathy towards sin, but notice the appointment for judgment. Verse 12 says, Therefore will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. You know what God's saying with all these judgments? They're a precursor to an appointment day with God. I mean, we've got it fixed in our minds tonight. There's an appointment day with God. Judgment day. John chapter 5 says this, verse 25 to 29. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they, shall, they that hear shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, so is he given to the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good, and let me qualify the word good, that's not talking about good works. The good goes back to verse 24, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and got saved. You know, listen, the, the, the first good work that God's going to acknowledge is a good work of faith in Jesus Christ, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ there. He says, and they shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil. Evil is rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior. They that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now, be very careful. Notice this. This appointment, this preparation to meet God, listen, it is inevitable. It is unavoidable. You can't cancel the appointment. You can't reschedule. I mean, you can call your doctor, you can call your optometrist, call your dentist, you can call DMV, whoever maybe you make an appointment. You can cancel the appointment, you can reschedule, but not with God. He set the day and he said, you're going to show up, son. Yes, you are. You're going to show up, sir. You're going to show up, ma'am. You're going to be there that day, and I'm going to make sure you're there. He said, everything I'm talking about here, the famines and droughts and wars and all those things, those are precursors because he said, you're a spiritual being. Your body may cease to exist here, but your spirit still, your soul still lives up. You're going to meet with God. Listen, that judgment day is in inevitable. Secondly, judgment is individual. Prepare to meet thy God. Thy God. Listen, it's one thing for an unsafe person to have a twisted, perverted, mixed up idea of who God is. Pantheism says God is in all nature. Polytheism says God, there's many gods. But even among God's people, believers, they get to the place where they've got a twisted, messed up concept of who God is. Listen, we need to begin by understanding He's holy. I mean, the attribute of God, he's holy, and not just holy, but holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts here. He's truth. He's righteous. We must understand, this is a holy and righteous God we stand before. Holy and reverent is his name, the Bible says. Prepare to meet 
by God. You're gonna meet him individually. Now for the believer, there's twofold judgment I wanna talk about. First of all, for the believer, Romans 14, 12 says this, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether it be good or bad. Now listen tonight. If you're saved, if you're saved, say amen. amen. If you're saved tonight, your sins were judged on the cross. Amen. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. So this judgment here is not talking about judging your sins. Bless God, those stinking sins were judged already on Jesus. The judgment there he's talking about, he's talking about there, the judgment of our works. The things done in our body, whether it be good or whether it be bad. We're going to stand before the Lord to give an account of how we live this life. It's a judgment to determine rewards. Are we, did what we do resemble gold, silver, and precious stones, or did what we do represent wood, hay, and stubble, which will burn? We're gonna stand before the Lord and give an account. That's a very fearful thing. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. So for the believer, our sins are judged already. It's been taken, they've been judged on Christ, but we have to realize it doesn't mean we live a careless life and we turn the grace of God into lasciviousness as we talked about Sunday night. No, it means that we've got to realize we've got to make every moment of our life count for Jesus Christ. But then there's the individual judgment of the unbeliever. In Acts 17, 31, Paul said this, because he is appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, Whereof he has given assurance that all men is, he, is that he has raised him from the dead. Now, Jesus is going to judge this world in righteousness, okay? He's keeping the account. Every sinner will be judged. And we read in Revelation 20, uh, verse 12 and 13, I saw the dead, uh, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their, their works, and the sea gave of the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to works. Listen, Listen, uh, the, the, listen that, that first death is not the last death. There's a second death. Yeah, they're going to go to hell. And that's not a good thing. But death and hell are going to cough all the dead back up. And they're going to stand individually to that, before that, what we call the great white throne. In holiness, our Lord and Savior, according to Acts 17, 31, and, and according to John chapter 5, will judge the world in righteousness. Judgment is earthly through the chase of God, but judgment is also eternal after this life. There is an appointment date with God. He says, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Beloved, we must realize something. Everything we do in this life is preparing ourselves to stand in the presence of God. That's why having a time with the Lord every day is a critical component of that, of making sure we are meeting with God now. We're making our appointment with God on a daily basis. We must prepare to meet our God. We must be prepared to see God. We don't want to stand before the judgment seat of Christ as God's people, unprepared. We don't want to come upon us as sudden destruction as it did with the rich man. The Bible commands every one of us to be judgment ready, to be judgment ready. That's why God told Hezekiah, he said, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. I'm saying tonight, we need to set some things in order in our lives and set some things in order about what we're doing. Listen, we're, when, we, when we have a birthday, we're not going backwards. There's no regression with our lives. We're, we're continuing onward until the Lord takes us home. We have to understand, we have a short life, time in this life. Life here is very short. We need to make the most of our life. For to me to live is Christ and to die is game. We see the appointment. The appointment is this, prepare to meet thy God. I want to ask you tonight, are you ready? Are you prepared to meet God? Are you prepared to give a good account for your life? Or we just kind of floating along and doing our thing and, and ignoring what's going on and saying, well, my health is good today. And we're, I'm, we're going to be like that rich man in Luke 12. We're going to say, oh, oh, so you've done very well. Let's eat, eat, drink, and be merry. Don't you realize God looks down upon that foolish thinking? And he says, thou fool, tonight thy soul shall be required of thee. We see the atrocities of sin. We see the aftermath of sin. We see the apathy towards sin. We see the appointment of judgment. But I want to close with one final thing tonight. I want to speak to you tonight with a word of encouragement because we need encouragement, amen? amen. I want to speak to you tonight about the avoidance of judgment. 
Now, you're not going to avoid the judgment day, but the Bible's saying is here, prepare to meet your God. And we can prepare the right way. And I want you to see something that is a blessing. Go with me to the very last verse of verse 13. In verse 13, God has spoken all this to Amos, and you can imagine the, the people are very shocked. I mean, they're very shaken by this harsh message. And then he closes the message, the same way he started it, by speaking about God. He said, for lo, he that formeth the mountains and createth the winds. Now, circle the words formeth and createth. He's bringing Israel back to remind her, you didn't make yourself, God made you. He's your creator. And that mountain of Samaria, he made that mountain. And Mount Sinai, where Moses received the Ten Commandments, he made that mountain. He said, now, the one who made, formed the mountains and the one who made the wind, and as we know from John 3, we, don't, we can't predict the wind. It comes and it goes. He says, but God controls the wind. And he says this, For lo, that he that formeth the mountains and createth the wind and declareth unto man, what is his thought? Would you underline that phrase? He is our creator. He is a holy and righteous God. He's the God who's all-powerful. He's the God who speaks. He's the God who is judged. But he's also the God who's merciful. He's also the God who forgives. Would you look at that phrase again? And declareth unto man what is his thought. Hey, listen, tonight, you know what God thinks about you? You know what God thinks about you? For I know the thoughts I think of you, thought of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Amen? God, God what God thinks about you? God wants you to repent. God wants you in fellowship with him. God wants you to experience his mercies. God wants you to experience his love. God wants you to experience great grace in your life. God wants you to experience the mercies of God. God wants you to experience for the first time in a long time what it means to have a holy life and a cleansed life and a purified life. Listen, some of those stinking old sins that have gotten a hold of us, like a stain on the wall that hasn't been addressed, and that stain has embedded itself. It's kind of like mold that grows on a wall, and it's got it's gone all the way through the, the texture of that wall, and you might have to just cut that old piece of plaster out and replace it with a new piece of plaster there. You know what God's saying there? Listen, some of our sins that we've got, our ancient sins that have stuck with us for a long time, they're stinking, they're putrid, they're, 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 they've just they've ruined our lives. And God says, look, I understand all that, but I want you to know I'm the one who formed the mountains. I'm the one that created the winds. And I want to declare to you what my thoughts are for you. He said, listen, I don't want to have to do all these things. I want you to be prepared to stand before me and to give a good account of your life. I want you to be like the good steward, the good steward there, uh, there in Matthew 25, where I can say, well done thou good and faithful servant. He says, I know the thoughts I think of you. I know that you can turn around. I know that you can do right. I know that you can repent. I know that you can receive forgiveness. I know that you can get cleansing. But he said, it's up to you to decide you want to do that. He said, for I know the thoughts I think towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you shall seek me and find me when you search for me for all your heart. Listen, the message of the prophets are all the same. Then notice Psalms 130, verse 3 and 4. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? That's a good question. If God marks iniquities, we don't stand a chance. But, but, there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. So you look at this verse here. Verse 13 says, For lo, he that formeth the mountain, and createth the wind, and declareth unto man what is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness, and treadeth upon the high place of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Thus saith the Lord. Their morning did turn to darkness. But I want to tell you, God can turn your darkness into morning too. Amen? God wants us to experience his mercy. God wants us to receive his forgiveness. I mean, don't you get the idea there? If God should mark iniquities, who shall stand? But there's forgiveness with God that he may be feared. The message is the same. God's people must repent. God's people must return. And if you're not saved, you must receive. Prepare to meet thy God. 
Are you prepared to meet God? Are you sending ahead? Thank God for those who filled out a faith promise pledge. But if you're one of those who just kind of said, scoffs at it, and your idea is, well, the church wants my money. No, listen, let me tell you something tonight. The church doesn't want your money. God, you, you, the money belongs to God. It's his. The tithe is the Lord's. The tithe is holy to the Lord. I mean, can we get that through our thick heads? Offerings are an exhibit of our appreciation, our thankfulness, a love towards God. One day a king died. His servants spread the unexpected and unbelievable news throughout all the palace. He died in his sleep that night from natural causes. And like most kings, he had a an ensemble, ensemble of counselors. And one of them asked a question. They got together because they had to think about, okay, what do we do with the kingdom and what's going to go on here? But instead of talking about the kingdom, they were so grieved by the passing of this king, the unexpected passing. One of them asked, where has he gone? We know he's passed, but where did he go? To which one of the other counselors said, why, to heaven, of course. Where do you think he went? But one of the more trusted counselors We've been part of that king's inner circle with a very remorseful tone of voice said no he didn't go to heaven I served this king for many years and I traveled with him to many places he loved to travel and as he traveled as he thought about where he would go he would give careful attention in preparing for that journey, and he would go every, over every detail and talk about that detail of that journey with other people. Every element was planned and anticipated. He said, I have never heard our king speak a word about traveling to heaven. It is a journey for which I saw him make no preparation. And that counselor said with great remorse, I am quite sure he did not go to heaven. Prepare to meet thy God. In chapter 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? God began the first message by saying, we're not on the same page. Amos gets to the second message. He says, okay, we've been dealing with sin. Now we've got to talk about judgment. And with judgment, we've got to talk about an appointment day. Prepare to meet thy God. We need to be prepared. God has two places he's prepared. First, God has prepared hell. Read about it in the Bible. In Matthew, he said, I have prepared hell for the devil, the demons, and all who have rejected his salvation. Hell has already been prepared. But second, Jesus said he's prepared a place for us in heaven. He said, my father's house are many mansions, and I go there to prepare a place for you. Now, God's done his preparation. We need to get prepared. It could be our affairs are not where they need to be. Let's start making good preparation. And set our affairs in order. It's what he told Hezekiah. Set thine house in order. Prepare to meet the Lord as a righteous judge. Prepare to meet the Lord as your Savior.